this poem is called Mike is Moving to Manhattan and it's uh, dedicated to my roommate Mike Kilveris and my old friend Tobias Epstein and John thank you for all your lovely support over the many years so my good friend Mike is moving out. He's been my roommate since September. He came when Todd left 47th Street in Astoria. I'm sure he won't miss the long walk to the subway or how when you come down the block towards Ditmars, you always see the same bus go by you. So I'm sure he'll miss the Greek restaurants and the track at the park and maybe even the train rides into the city. And on the way to Hunter and Manhattan College, he'll teach existentialism and intro to ethics. Mike, who makes popcorn once a week and watches Netflix in his room, who quit eating cheese because of the cholesterol, who lets his hair run a little long these days, who is moving to Manhattan with his girlfriend, Kara, where the recession has made the rents lower, probably Murray Hill, maybe the Upper East Side, and so off he goes one more time. He was at 14th Street in Astoria before me, and upstate in Rhinebeck before that, and home in Akron for a summer before that, and before that, Pittsburgh, and before that, Salinas in California. And before that, Boston for a summer, and before that, Saratoga, and before that, Bexley, just outside Columbus, Ohio. And after all this, Lord knows where he'll be. We joke about only finding jobs in Kansas and Arkansas, and how no one will go with us to these places, and how hard we'll have to work to stay in New York, and we laugh in the living room, asking ourselves, when did our lives get like this? And we smile, saying things like, we've made huge life decisions without considering the consequences. And we giggle together the way we always did in Moore Hall, the big, ugly, pink dorm in Saratoga. Our single beds across from each other, reading late into the night before cutting the lights and imitating the voices of our professors. Wondering why everyone hated us, even though no one probably thought of us. We kept wondering how we got where we were. We kept wondering how we got here in New York almost 10 years after we met. It's funny the way some people just stick to you. You keep calling them like your body can hear memories in their voice. I kept calling Mike all these years. Hey man, what's up? How are you? The other day, Mike said he might move out on May 15th and not June 1st, and I freaked out on him about the rent, and I had to apologize later about it, and I explained it really had less to do with the money than with the fact that we were splitting apart. And he's moving to the city where I'm afraid I won't see him, and New York is the kind of place where it's hard to see someone unless both people make an effort to try. You have to balance who comes and who goes. I'm afraid I'll only see him once or twice a month, and it makes me want to remember all the things we've been doing or did, but really the friendship has always been all the things we said to each other, and really how we listen, how Mike listens. He's the kind of person that concentrates when you talk. He remembers the details of the things you tell him. He asks follow-up questions, and he always hesitates to drop anything on you, or even when he should. And he's the first to admit his faults, like maybe that he works too much. He had a beer with dinner on Wednesday last week, and this was a huge deal. He said a few weeks ago that he'd rather have one or two friends that you don't have to think about, rather than make conversation with strangers. Mike Kilveris, you're moving to the densest place in America where you'd be surrounded by strangers. I think it'll be good for you. My mind flashes to the Christmas card picture in the fridge of Toby and Katie in Columbia, Missouri. I saw them last in January 2007, drove there in the winter. I saw them living together the way Mike will live with Kira soon. Me and Toby took a big trip together in the summer of 1999, saved up for two years and went to Europe. I remember he'd get so pissed at me because we'd get to a bench in Paris and he'd want to sit there watching people and I'd get up and start pacing around saying, let's walk around, let's go somewhere else, let's look around that block down there. And he'd tell me, seriously, sit down, I'm serious, can we just sit here and relax, can you please just chill the fuck out? It was a run joke between us. The only other summer we hung out in 1994. We were 13 going on 14. I made him bike all over Upper Arlington and Columbus for no reason. I kept saying it was an adventure. I kept saying we were going to find something. That something was going to happen to us. That I bike fast as hell trying to find whatever was supposed to find us. And I gave him my mom 1970s Schwinn bicycle which was super heavy. And then my sister's bike when the Schwinn broke and he hated both of them. And he hated how fast we rode around. He was complaining about how hot it was. How the sun was making him sweat. He kept telling me to slow down. And once on Redding Road I turned around and he wasn't there, he was a few houses back. My mom's bike was laying tossed in someone's yard and he was just standing there on the sidewalk, both his arms up, just standing there flicking me off and laughing as I turned around and tried to convince him that I knew for a fact that the adventure we were waiting for was just ahead and all he had to do was just hurry up and we'd go and find it. We met on the bus, he sat in the back with the cool kids. I sat in the middle by myself that entire year. I was really not that cool at all. I bought a Columbus Clippers baseball cap because my dad said everyone really liked the Clippers and we just moved to Ohio from North Carolina. And everyone kept saying to me, ring my bell for a few weeks. Then I found out there was a really annoying commercial for the Clippers that said, Columbus Clippers, ring your bell. And I never really recovered from that. That was the year of braces and zits and getting rid of my southern accent and learning not to gel my hair off to one side, go figure. The year I read Catcher in the Rye and discovered Nirvana's Nevermind, Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I out ads of Cindy Crawford from the pages of fashion magazines at the pharmacy down by Route 33 
and took them home and I just stared at her in a bathing suit wondering if I'd ever kiss a girl. And two weeks before school ended that year, I passed Toby on the bus and he was listening to his Sony cassette Walkman. And I asked him about it and he said he was listening to Pearl Jam and I said, I like them. And then a couple weeks later, I invited him over to play basketball in my driveway because I heard he was good at basketball. But my driveway didn't have a basketball hoop, so Toby humored me by dribbling the ball around and then tossing it up on the roof of the garage. And then it would roll back down. And when my whole family moved to our house on Stonehenge Court that summer, we did have a hoop and he just schooled me at 21 every day for a summer. His dad would drive him out from Reynoldsburg about 25 minutes away and I-270. I used to wait by the window for him to arrive. He'd pop out of the car with his overnight bag and smile. For six weeks, we spent almost every night together at that house, taking turns in the sleeping bag in the bed, listening to Disarm on the CD boombox, talking about the girls we liked. And suddenly he said he was moving to Missouri in August and we talked about how we were best friends and we'd stay up light talking all night with that urgency that belongs to kids who are about to grow up or think they're about to grow up or who both read Catcher in the Rye and saw Eddie Vedder on Saturday Night Live and who bought band t-shirts for the first time. I got a Smashing Pumpkins t-shirt that summer. And before he left, I felt super cool wearing it with him. I think we thought that maybe we could grow up to those songs the way Kevin Arnold grew up to Joe Crocker at the beginning of The Wonder Years. Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song and I'll try not to sing out of key. We thought those songs would lead us to the lives that we could make of those songs or we could at least live a life where the intensity of fear and love that kept us awake all night talking might never be lost. Like we could grow ourselves into that music. And so when Toby brought a guitar the next summer, I guess I wasn't surprised. And this morning, Mike was strumming his guitar at the table and I made breakfast and I remembered our first year at Skidmore. We signed up for the freshman year talent show and had a couple of drinks or something beforehand. And uh, we had never played guitar for anyone other than ourselves and this was our big chance to be music guys. I think Mike had the same fantasy as me and Toby. We got out on stage and there was 100 people in the audience and we started playing eight days a week and it was pretty bad. And we played I Won't Back Down and we were mumbling and some people started to leave and I couldn't hear myself anymore. I thought maybe we shouldn't have covered all of these songs and I could tell that we weren't playing in tune and we weren't even really strumming at the same time and maybe even weren't playing the same chords. And by the time we got to another brick in the wall, I realized that this was a terrible song to pick for two acoustic guitars and it had one chord over and over, B minor. And then we got to Immortality by Pearl Jam and I just stopped playing. I smiled at this girl that was staring at Mike and my ears were burning red. And we still joke about this every time we play guitar together we still call that show our downfall. Never to be cool again, we would never play seriously again in college, just studied all the time. And a couple weeks ago, we were joking about our futures the way we did back then. Only now I was acting out our parts in 20 years when we were both dads and our sons were hitting puberty and angry all the time. Their blood dosed with testosterone and I told him to relax about his time now in New York because one day you'll walk into this room with some kid that's just angry at you for no reason and you're going to be buying him all this food and doing anything possible to keep this kid from freaking out the way we freaked out when we were his age. And we'll ask him a question and he'll yell back the answer and say, leave me alone, Dad. Can I even be alone in my bedroom? And how we'll leave him alone and head to the basement and sit in an old chair facing an old laptop and rub our temples and sigh. And remember living in a story and so on. And we laughed and laughed the way we laughed when we got lost going to Ikea last fall in the rain, driving around in circles, wondering how two PhD students could get this lost even after using Google Maps. And how we got lost in Florida a couple summers ago, stuck in the weirdness of St. Petersburg and Tampa. And I say all this because sometimes a good friendship isn't about what you do together, but what you say together. How you laugh at yourselves, what you imagine, how you get lost, how you un how you get unstuck from the hurt of your own life, the absurd terror of always growing up and never growing up, this knowledge that ultimately they can't stay anywhere because of a friend, because of you. So they go to Missouri and they go to Manhattan and their leaving you reveals what you are, that I remain a kind of a boy, not quite grown, who at 28 feels sad his friend is leaving, my friend who's been sleeping over since September, who plays guitar in the morning and never got on SNL, who found me for the same reasons I found him, because we were restless to find the person that would move with us, because we won't we always just keep moving isn't that what brought us here sitting with our friends in rooms like this with music in the background our friends who are always ready to dream us back into the past where we imagined our futures when those futures were always open and we were always just a few streets away from finding in the summer sun this other person who your friends can know but never know like they know you and so friendships are weird you love people you have to leave and who leave you and so with friendships you really have to be grateful and so I will always remember with Mike and Toby Toby who will bring Katie with him if they come in June Mike who I will visit with Kira, the way I saw David last night with Claudia, the way they probably see me now with Nina. And I think about the way we were restless together, the way we worried about the future beyond our friendship and waited for it, and how much love passed between us as we waited to leave each other, and how we got through it laughing at ourselves, and how long it took to find people to love us other than each other, to find someone that would not just sleep over, but sleep with us. So that I say, Mike, this is it. This is the life you have always wanted. And Toby, I say, I hope you guys are relaxed on the couch. Keep playing the guitar, enjoy how you became the person you waited for. 
and just promise me sometime every now and then we'll find the time to jam when the summer suddenly happens and the air feels somehow like Ohio. Thanks a lot.